Good afternoon everyone and thank you for inviting me. I am a computational biologist. So I use computers to solve biological problems. And every summer I spend uh, some amount of time with very bright high school students to show them how to use computers to solve biological problems. Now you are probably wondering, do computers and biology mix together? When I was uh, at URA in high school, I had no idea they would go together. In fact, I had a very big decision to make at that time. My parents were both doctors, so they encouraged me to be a doctor. But I really, really loved math. I went, went to Germany as Indian team, uh, part of Indian team in the International Math Olympiad. So I followed my passion and wanted to be for, uh, do math and computer science. And then later on, after a long backpack packing trip to South America, I somehow got convinced that biology is interesting. And that was a long time after I spent uh, my PhD and everything else. So that's how I got into biology, but there is good news for you. Today, if you are faced with a similar decision, you can do not have to choose math or biology, you can choose both. Because of a technological revolution, the world of computer science and biology are coming together. So the computer scientists of today are finding their most inspiring problems in biology, whereas the doctors of today are using more and more computer algorithms to solve their problems. Rather than doctor, I should say medical researchers. And that's quite turning out to be quite fascinating world. The, te the, the technology at the core of this revolution is DNA sequencing. Conceptually, you can think of a DNA sequencer as a microscope, which instead of giving you images, gives A, T, G, 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 all these little characters. Let's say you take dirt from here, from the floor, there must be some living materials and you get some A, T, G, 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 and then you are eat, going to eat a sandwich from a fast food joint, you put it in the sequencing machine and you get another bunch of A, T, G, G, G. Now if your sandwich gives you this set of letters, be very careful, that's not on the menu, that's E. coli. So you better advise to throw it away. Now, how did I know that those letters are coming from E. coli or how do you know? Well, I googled them. Anyway, actually not Google, but we have our special software that takes a string of a collection of letters and tells you that this is where it comes from. And that's where the computer scientists fit in. They take these letters that come out of these machines and then convert into different animals or living organisms and then pass that information to the biologist. So there is another way the world of computer and world of sequencing are coming together. The cost of both are falling. You may or may not have heard of Moore's law. That's the slope that's showing how fast the computer cost of computer is falling. But you have seen its impact. When I graduated after my PhD, moved to California, I bought this huge piece of furniture called a computer. So there are two big movers came with two boxes. One was computer, one was the monitor. I had to get a quite stable table to get them together. Five years later, I got a laptop, my computer moved to my bed. Another five years, we have this iPhone, computer moves to the pocket. And in terms of application, you can see that tiny iPhone can do a lot of things. It can, you can play music with it, you can call a cab, you can see maps, you can text on your friends. And after all this, if you have batteries left, maybe you can call your grandma because it's after all a phone. Now, what does the uh, sequencing machine do when the Christ drops down? Here is the clue. It's a kind of microscope. So you can take it anywhere and then figure out what kind of materials are there, what kind of living organisms are there. And the living organisms, are the kind of living organisms you can try and solve the problems are very, very vast. The living world is vast, beautiful and full of mysteries. So you can use this sequencing machine to 
I will take on a backpacking trip. You don't have to take the machine, but you collect samples from your backpacking trip, or you can solve problems in medicine. You can go underwater, and you can do all kinds of solve all kinds of problems. I chose about four or five examples to show how versatile this technology is. Okay, I spent a number of months in hospitals in India because of a family reason. And if you ask me what's the biggest medical problem facing the world, it's not cancer or heart disease or even malaria. It's kind of bugs that are growing in the hospitals in India. So what's going on is the antibiotics have become very cheap. So the doctors there use them very generously. They make cocktails of antibiotics. And in the meanwhile, we haven't discovered too many antibiotics over the last few years. But the bacteria have gone, become much smarter. So they have learned to evade the antibiotics. And then, now we have these bacteria, they are, cannot be killed with any antibiotic. I was reading a story in the newspaper. This is just recent, uh, last month. A lady in Nevada went to the hospital and none of the 26 antibiotics they, the hospital has or maybe the whole medical industry has worked on her. And I checked her history. She went to India. She was hospitalized in India and then came back. So nothing worked. She died. And these uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria are growing everywhere in Indian hospitals. And they don't need visa, they cannot be stopped by a wall, they are coming to US. So be very worried. But one way to detect them is to use this new sequencing machine. Because think of it, these bacteria have only a small parts, maybe four or five letters change. And just by changing those few letters in their DNA, they can evade the antibiotics. So, by using just the microscope, the regular microscope, you cannot identify them. They look the same as the regular bacteria. This new technology will be able to identify them. And then comes the other side. We may be able to find new antibiotics because the antibiotics come from a, another set of good bacteria. So, there are lots of research going on to find this cluster of antibiotics. These are all computer-based research find cluster of antibiotics from all the bacteria people have sequenced to know about potential solution. Okay, so let's say you are not that interested in spending your time in hospitals. You love traveling. Now think of traveling. Why do we travel? We have, want to get stories. We come back and tell our friends how we saw these exotic people or what not. And you become famous among friends. The, one of the earliest European travelers who became very famous was Marco Polo. He told such a good story, even 1,000 years or 800 years later, we know his name. Marco Polo looked at people, the different culture, went to China and India. And about 200 or 300 years, we exhausted telling stories about people. Then the travelers started to look at the different animals and other things. So, in 1750s, Linnaeus, who was a Swedish boat scientist, took a, uh, made a collection of all the living big organisms that are around the world. He had this whole group of people going around. There was Captain Cook who went to Australia and found information. So everything was collected in his book. By 1700, 1800, we exhausted all the big things. And then the biologists started to look for small things. It's the same idea. You come and tell all these stories about what, what kind of brittle you saw in an exotic place. Somehow the uh, way we travel and tell stories and the way biologists think, the, all, we used to call them naturalists, have very uh, lot of similarities. So the naturalists, naturalists collected this brittle and Darwin was one of them who he was a big uh, brittle collector. So by 18th, 19th century, we collected all the beetles and bugs. Then some biologists started to look for things through the microscope, whether they can find exotic things. Now, we are in the late 20th and 21st century. Is it too late to find anything new? The answer is no. Uh, there was a scientist 
in around 1980s, he looked around, uh, two scientists from the, uh, Illinois Urbana Champaign, they looked around all the microorganisms using this new microscope that I call it, that uses sequencing and computer algorithm, and found that there is an entire class of organisms that we never knew about. So think about uh, the way we think of this microscopic world. There are these us, which are big, and there are these germs. Your mom often tells you, I mean, maybe not here, but in India, our mom says, always boil your water because that's how the germs die. Now, uh, that's the big ones are called eukaryotes, and the small ones are bacteria. And then these guys found out that there is an entire class who really love boiling water. So that's the archaea. They live in these hot streams in Yellowstone and all other natural, uh, natural, national parks. So if you really like traveling, maybe to the Yellowstone National Park, looking for archaea could be a good, good possibility. And as I said, they are first found, uh, found out by using this new technology of sequencing. Now you are thinking that, oh, archaea are so useless that only it's for biologists are being uh, free trips to Yellowstone, but that's not true. There was a, a group. It's a, it became the uh, it became the source of a new discovery, a revolutionary new discovery, on which the two big universities are now fighting for a patent. It's called CRISPR, and it all started because a scientist named Francisco Mojica, he was in Spain and started looking into the genomes of bacteria, the DNA sequences that come out. And he found out a very strange pattern. There was a part of the genome of bacteria, it matched a virus. This bacteria and virus are always fighting each other, but there is no reason you find the pattern from here to there. It's kind of like going to Japan and opening a 15th century text and finding out Shakespeare's uh, writing there. They are so far away, there is no reason to find unique uh, similar pattern. But he found them and then he spent 10 years and researched them and the result was to find out that these bacteria which are archaea which we thought are really, really dumb are actually quite smart. They have this adaptive immune system just like us. And using that component of the immune system, now biologists can cure diseases in humans. So what happened, it's kind of ironic that thing that this biologist, uh, the archaea and bacteria invented, now two scientists from Berkeley and uh, Broad Institute in Harvard are fighting about the patent right. So it's invented by the bacteria and archaea, but we are trying to find out uh, if humans are calling inventors to use it as medicine. Okay. Uh, this is one of my own project with a large group of collaborators. When Darwin was uh, leaving, he did not know about Archaea, but that doesn't mean he did not have anything uh, complex to work on. In his book, he wrote that this is electric fish. They, they live in Amazon and they give you electric shock if you touch them. Darwin wrote that this fish gives special difficulty to his theory of evolution. They, this is one of the few cases that can prove his theory of evolution wrong. But uh, after 100 years of Darwin uh, died, there was a group of scientists who worked on the electric fish and found out that they use their electric signal to communicate. So this is like a sixth sense, in, apart from the five senses that I have, they can communicate. And then it took another 50 years before we, uh, after that point, when we, as a big collaboration, started to look into the genome of the electric fish and the same th method used the new sequencing technology and computer programs to figure out how this whole uh, electric organ and electric uh, uh, passing electricity works. So we found out, all, uh, we are not only found out, we are still working on it, uh, we found out these chemicals, the proteins and genes inside the body of electric fish, which are helpful in giving it the electric part and special property. So that's another example. And this example is uh, quite personal to me because when my son was born, that was in California, 
My, uh, before my son was born, we went to the hospital for a routine genetic test and the doctor said, oh, there is something uh, wrong with the test results, you should come. And we went to meet the genetic counselor, he said, maybe the tests are saying that he can have Down syndrome. So we got very worried and the doctor said, we need to do another test called amniocentesis to find out. Uh, but it's an invasive test. So I sat down with the results and also the uh, everything I could find out about the amniocentesis. And I, I found that the, the chances of the first test getting wrong was more than the damage that can be do done by the second test. So I decided, no, I don't want to have this amniocentesis done, which was invasive test. And had to uh, spend next six months being worried what will happen to my son. He came out to be okay. But today the scientists have come up with this non-invasive test. It's the same technology, but what happens is uh, the blood from the baby leaks into the mom's blood. Uh, the uh, blood or DNA samples from the baby leaks into mom's blood. So the doctors can take mom's blood and sequence it and find out what the DNA of the kid will look like. It's completely non-invasive, there is no risk involved. And this is one of the uh, research going on in University of Washington and I saw another paper just recently where it says it, they can find within five weeks what the baby is going to be like, the genetic characteristics. So that's another quite exciting result. So I have covered a lot of things, but it's only a small subset of the different applications the biologists are thinking of using this new technology. So you can see that with this new technology, the future of biology and medicine are changing completely. But nothing of future is, the future is not complete with the people who are going to be there, that's the young generation. So what happened was I thought about the way the college students, the high school students are learning biology versus what's going on in the college in the advanced research. And everything is changing so fast that the, the college students, the high school students were not catching up. So I started this coding for medicine program where we spend time with the high school students and teach them about these different applications and this whole new technology that is coming up. And even if you don't, uh, I mean, whether you are part of this program or otherwise, the good news is that all of these data are out in the public. Most of these genetic data from all organisms are publicly available, all the programs are publicly available, the software programs. So you can even do the same self-learning and learn about this great new future, that's the genetic future with the new technologies. So with that, thank you very much.